Hi everybody, this is Marlene. I want to let you know that this podcast version of the show has been edited because there were some portions of it that just don't make sense for those of you who are just listening. However, if you would like to see and hear the entire show, you can go to YouTube and look us up under Miami Ghost Chronicles. And thank you so very much for listening and being part of our audience. saw me going in there uh, into Glade's correctional facility that's located in Bell Glade and um, I really was unable to really go exploring into the interior and in a way I'm glad I didn't because they've heightened security because back in September of 2017 uh, four teenagers are suspected of of having uh, basically caused a fire that caused quite some type of damage to the interior of the chapel as you can see from my shots you really can't tell from the outside but from the inside it was damaged but I was able to explore a lot of that area where I guess they would activate a team in case there was any type of emergency uh, that happened at the prison when it was still active now just to give you a little bit of history because everybody's always asking me that they want to know more about these places that I go to um, first of all this, uh, prior to Bell Glade being established uh, in 1928, it was a very small farming town called Chosen. All right, And what happened was, there was a big hurricane back in 1928, very large loss of life, especially a lot of the workers and the farmers that worked out here, almost 3,000 dead, possibly more. And after that event, that's when they renamed it to Bell Glade. Now, that, this actual prison was first called Florida Prison Farm Number 2, and it opened in 1932. Uh, and it was, it was changed in 1951 to Glade State Prison Farm and then to Glade's Correctional Institution in 1962. Now, by January of 1933, it was already overcrowded as it was the overflow prison for Rayford up in northern Florida. By the way, Rayford is uh, the location where Florida would carry out its executions and or used to carry in what was known as Sparky, the electric chair. As a matter of fact, they have a very uh, part of the famous part of the prison called Flat Top, which is where they used to house those people that were eventually going to be executed. But anyway, um, Even back in 1934, they already had uh, things going on there. Uh, They had 25 inmates that barricaded themselves with only one axe. And um, they sent police over from West Palm Beach. And a hole was made in the roof and tear gas was dropped in. Now, one of the punishments that happened to these prisoners was that they sent the leaders to what they called the sweat box. And the sweat box was the form of punishment they had. You know, you've heard of solitary confinement. Well, they had that. But the ultimate punishment was a sweat box. And out here in Florida, not only is it hot, it's extremely humid. And I imagine that sweat box, being put in that sweat box, could drive a person to the brink of death, I imagine, if depending on what time of the year it was. But anyway, that's that's what ended up being one of the punishments. Now... From the moment uh, that they started this, uh, why it was called a prison farm originally was they were sending the prisoners out here as labor force to grow a bunch of vegetables and basically run it as a farm. Uh, In 1935, they produced 10,000 gallons of syrup in one year and they had about 2,000 laying hens. And they also had a tannery specializing in alligator hides and also a shoe factory. Now, uh, despite what you may think, 
uh, even with the threat of going to the sweat box, back in 1936, they had an average of 72 prisoners escape in a six-month period, which is a lot. Um, and in, as a matter of fact, in 1949, they had a convict who was serving a life sentence for killing a police officer back in 1938. He's, he escaped, and he was eventually recaptured three years later in 1952 in New York. Okay, so, I mean, this, these grounds, I was only there maybe a little while. But I'm sure uh, if those walls could talk, there's a lot that could be uh, captured in evidence. Uh, whether it's residual hauntings or active hauntings, I would not be surprised at all. That under the right circumstances and given enough time, it would be a treasure trove of paranormal uh, proof that could be captured there. Now, back in 1995, there was another event that took place. As a matter of fact, it was right on January 2nd, 1995, and Florida had its largest prison break in 15 years. Uh, they had six inmates who escaped from Glades Correctional via a tunnel they had dug beneath the chapel, which was under construction at the time. The tunnel was eight feet deep, two feet wide, and 25 yards long. Now, a correctional officer noticed some of the inmates as they were making their getaway and fired two gunshots. However, they, it wasn't meant to hit any of them. Nobody was hit. Now, one inmate by the name of Felix Carbonell, he was apprehended almost immediately outside the prison fence. And the remaining escapees were Hector Rivas, age 32, Juan Fleitas, age 30, Jesus Martinez, age 47, Florencio Alvarez, age 39, and Armando Junco, age 62. Now, these were all very, very serious offenders. Uh, some of them had committed murders. They were all serving life sentences with 25-year mandatory, which means they were not going to be up for parole or a possibility of parole until they had served 25 years. Now, after they had all gotten away, um, police got a tip from two homeless men living in Miami. They, they approached the Florida Highway Patrol station, and their information... Uh, led to the capture of Alvarez and the death of Junco, who was shot by my Miami police officer during the recapture. And um, if you think that it was just being good citizens, not really. There was a $10,000 reward for each prisoner. And those two guys got $20,000, 10000 for each of the two men that were captured. Now, Rivas was caught next 10 days after the escape by a patrol officer who spotted him walking in Little Havana. And Martinez was caught the next day, also in Little Havana, when he made the mistake of walking in front of a patrol car and, of course, was recognized. Um, now, Flatus is the one that was on the loose until August 3rd when Mexican police alleged that he shot a lady by the name of Dania Leva Fletas, no relation to each other, during a bungled robbery. As you could tell, these guys are criminals. They, Wherever they land, uh, a lot of them, as a matter of fact, had come over in the Marielle boat lift, and they were already criminals there. They kept on in criminal activities here, and Fletas went up in Mexico. Here, he gets uh, involved in another robbery, and um, he was there and he was working as a waiter busboy at a mall seafood restaurant in the Mexican city of Merida. Uh, now, subsequent to the shooting, his picture was in the Merida newspapers and a tipster thought he looked a lot like the fugitive Fleitas featured on America's Most Wanted. Now, this tipster called the FBI. Fingerprints were exchanged with Mexico and, of course, they matched. However... Okay, Fletus is still in Mexico awaiting extradition back to Florida. Okay, uh, why? Because uh, depending on what type of, even though he, he hadn't received a death sentence, I know that sometimes certain countries will extradite, but not if the person uh, faces the death penalty, which I really, I'm not sure what the case is or why they would not have sent him back immediately to the United States, considering that he had already, he was a convicted criminal. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, the the reason why Fleitas he had he was uh, he was a Cuban, and he had come over on the Marriott boat lift, and immediately began breaking into houses. And on Halloween night in 1985, him and a friend tried to burglarize a West Hialeah home that they had scouted out while they were doing odd jobs in the area. But then 21-year-old Miguel Perez came home unexpectedly and flaked his panic and shot him three times in the face with a 45 caliber machine gun. So when I say that these were very serious uh, criminals, I wasn't kidding. Uh, and unfortunately, that's, uh, that's what ends up sometimes, uh, once they get out, they go right back to what they were doing. Now, due to this, um, the, eventually there were plans looked at to privatize. They made upgrades to the security in the prison, uh, they considered privatizing the prison, and uh, bottom line, in 2011, they shut the prison down, which is, of course, how you see it. It's all empty. And it left about 300 people in the area jobless. There was a lot of people there in Belglade that worked there in some capacity at the prison. Now, in 2014, the vacant facility and the surrounding property was purchased by a private local group, which included the prior mayor of Belglade. And... Um, they had even considered uh, giving the property for for free to the Atlanta Braves as a training facility. Um, however, I don't think that came to fruition, as you could tell. And um, like I said, in on August, I'm sorry, on August 2017, the church on the property was severely damaged due to fire. And uh, surveillance on the property captured three males and two females running from the property at the time of the fire. Which, by the way, I took a good look at those pictures of the surveillance. And they have a pretty good idea of who they are. I really don't know what became, if they've ever been captured or not. Now, Bell Glade in and of itself, like I said, it's always been like a farming community. It's had its own problems with crime. Um... One of the things which I thought was really interesting is that the original town of Chosen was built on what they call Indian mounds. Okay, the Native Americans that used to live in this area were mound builders, and a lot of these mounds, not all of them, but some of them, was what they would use for for burial. This is where they would bury their dead. There were some others that would bury them in Lake Okeechobee, which is very close by. As a matter of fact, I've done another show on all the amount of skeletal remains, lots that were found in uh, at one time in Lake Okeechobee. And uh, as a matter of fact, if you want the location, these Indian mounds are just south of Lake Okeechobee uh, uh, on the north shore of Canal Street at the Torrey Island Bridge. All right, now, well... Here we have this prison going on. Just to give you an example, uh, and this was just a few. May of 1929, the body of Charles Pirtle was found floating in a canal, and it turned out he had been drinking, fell into the canal, and drowned. Uh, in 1966, a skeleton of an unidentified man was found in the woods of Bell Glades. And they found out his first name was Juan. But they found that he had been shot to death and wrapped in a plastic and dumped in the marsh. Now, in the early 1980s, okay, the area around the town became the dumping ground for drug trade killings. Uh, in 1982, three bodies were found, two men and one woman. They were thought to be from the Marielle boat lift because they had, based on the type of tattoos that they had on their body, they had all been shot execution style. And they were unidentified, eventually buried as John and Jane Doe's. Like I said, they, and because they had come from Cuba, it was very difficult to basically to verify their identity. So as you could tell, and, and I mean, this was just a few of the stories that I came across while I was doing this. Uh, there was a lot of uh, 
just either mysterious deaths or crime committed around, among just the people that lived in the area. And uh, we're, now we're going to get into the good part, which is the ghost stories. Um, and there's quite a few. I'm, I'm going to go into not only the ones in Belle Glade, but there's a lot of farming communities that surround Lake Okeechobee, and they're very similar to Belle Glade. A lot of the industries are best done agricultural and the sugar cane or the sugar industry. Uh, first one, the, by the way, these are true stories uh, that people have gone ahead and talked about. Uh, the first one is out of Belle Glade. And the story is that the Second Street Bridge over the canal is haunted. Now, a number of years ago, these kids were daring each other to balance walk along the handlebar part of the bridge. One of them fell in. It's not a big fall. But this kid, he hit his head on a sharp rock and he died right there on the spot. The person writing the story says that he has seen this kid balancing on the handlebar not once but twice and he says that he see, knows that there's other people who have also seen him and uh, he said both times that I saw him he disappeared right after I noticed him uh huh okay next one we're going to a ghost out of Pahokee alright this person writes um, my great aunt Clara rented a house near the ice house in Pahokee my mother told me that when she visited the house as a child, the doors would open and close by themselves. Window shutters did the same. It was said that a woman was murdered in that house. And in the living room, there was a red stain on the floor that wouldn't wash out. If anybody knows where this house is, I would love for them to get in touch with me. Uh, we're going to move now on to the town of Clouston. Um... They're saying that on Lake Okeechobee has a ghost that can be seen by Highway 80, just south of Clouston. And there's this long earth dam. You go up on it and look out over the lake and just stare at it. And if you're in luck, the ghost of a man who was robbed and murdered and dragged into the lake after his car had broken down will appear in front of you. Um... After he appears, he will disappear just as fast. He just flashes out in front of your eyes. Now, it could be that ghost, but I'll let you know, in that hurricane in 1928, just that one alone, there was thousands of people that got killed there along the lake shore, and a lot of their bodies were never recovered uh, because they were just blown out into the lake and into the Everglades. So who knows whose ghost it is, or that... Most definitely, there's just more than one ghost. Now, the next one, the next story comes from Port LaBelle. And uh, the story goes, One day after a night of partying with my friends, I was driving to my home in Port LaBelle when I saw out of the corner of my eye a blinking light coming out of a nearby house. I stopped to check it out on the side of the road when I realized that there was a for sale sign in the yard. I looked through the windows and no one was there. The house was empty. The next day, I went over with a couple of my other friends and we called up the phone number on the sign and spoke to the real estate agent. And he said that the previous family of two was found dead in the attic of the house. Okay. Uh, next few stories are from Immokalee. Um, this one starts, I was around 10 years old. My dad and mom bought a brand new home on Immokalee Drive. The area was a heavy wooded area. Of course, they cleared the area for these homes that were being built. We finally got the house and right away we were hearing voices and finding these weird toys in the yard when we would play outside. My brother was the one being attacked the most. We would have a cousin stay over and one night they woke up in the middle of the night because they were hearing whispers and they looked and saw an old lady. 
They said she looked like a Native American lady blessing them. They couldn't move and they couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. There's too many things that have happened. There was a lot of people saying that the wooded area was an old Indian burial ground. Others say that they had found a lot of bodies. We really don't know if both of these things are true, but I think they are. Second story. There is a scary story about a creepy looking road at Immokalee, Florida called Pepper Road. Immokalee residents and former residents say that you can see the spirit of a little girl at the end of the road, which leads to Pepper Road Ranch. Witnesses, witnesses say that if you park your vehicle at the end of the road during nighttime and turn off your car for five to ten minutes, then turn it back on, you will see the little girl in front of your car. I used to live near the Immokalee Inn in Terra Park. I lived in a mobile home. I was about eight years old when I moved there. I had a strange feeling when we moved there and it always kept bugging me for some reason. One day I was sleeping next to my parents because my uncle was staying in my room. All of a sudden I heard footsteps coming from the kitchen. I saw this little figure like a little kid. It wasn't my imagination at all. I really couldn't see the face, only a white little figure. It stopped at the room where my uncle was staying in. I felt as if it were looking for me for some reason. When I turned around, I didn't see anything at all. The following day, my uncle asked my mom if I had gone in during the night to his room and tapped on his shoulder. I didn't say anything about what happened in the night. I was overhearing their conversation and that really freaked me out. Finally, my uncle left back to Mexico, so I had the room all to myself again. I forgot about what happened, but strange things kept happening during the night. I saw black shadows. They looked like they were looking at me. When I could see these black shadows, then they would disappear quickly. And I would always see these shadows anywhere I went throughout the mobile home. I even saw this black shadow at my school. I felt it kept watching over me. It was a creepy feeling. It lasted through fifth grade. I didn't investigate more because I thought nobody would believe me. Later on, I found out that a little boy died while his babysitter was babysitting him over in the area where the mobile home we lived at was at. I remembered now that little white figure I saw. I first thought it might have been an angel, but now I think it's that little boy. Well, it stopped when we moved out to another house, and I will never forget those experiences. Next story. It was about 1988. I was 12 years old, and we lived in a mobile home about a block away from Immokalee Middle School. One night, I woke up around 3 a.m. and heard heavy footsteps coming towards me into the living room where I had fallen asleep. Everyone was asleep and no one else could hear it but me as it came close enough to touch me. It just laughed deeply like somebody that was evil or wanted to play a joke on me but deeper, meaner. So I just covered my face with a cover until it faded away but I was fully awake. There's a large house and a smaller house and a fenced-in yard right across the street from the Immokalee Inn on the right side. The large house is used as a church, or it was when I lived in Immokalee. In the rear of the property is a two-story building. It's rented out as two separate apartments. My family rented the upstairs apartment for a while years ago which is where I encountered the apparition of what appeared to be a young teenage boy. When I moved in, I had a dog, and I kept her inside most of the time, 
but the landlord said I could only keep her if she stayed outside. I could build her a dog house and there was a lot of big trees on the property. Some of them fruit trees and this is where I chose to put my dog so I could see her out the window. But from the minute I moved her out there she would start to bark and bark and I tried everything I thought of as to what was making her bark from fruit falling off the tree to birds but she wouldn't stop as long as she was under the tree and she would growl viciously like she saw something I even went out there looked up and I still didn't see anything she kept doing it so I finally moved her behind the house and she seemed to settle down. And that's when whatever was out there came into the house and started bothering me. First, it was a smoke detector going off, but it would only beep for a few seconds. I changed the batteries and everything was fine, but then it would happen again. I felt like I was being watched. I decided to paint the kitchen. I had climbed up in front of the sink to reach the top of the wall. My step ladder was too short, so I was on the counter. I slipped and lost my balance. I was about to fall. I felt a hand square in the middle of my back, which of course scared me enough about killing myself. So I got down off the sink, and there was no one in the house but me. I searched everywhere and found no one. And my ho husband got home. I told him what happened. I didn't know whether to be thankful or just more frightened. I told my husband what had happened. And he kind of thought I was going crazy. Because the other night while recording some music for his band to practice, he felt a hand shove him. He stopped recording and turned on the TV. He said laughing that the ghost probably didn't like his music. Well, from time to time, whatever it is bothers the dog and messes with a smoke detector. But it didn't touch me again. But one night, I had to work night shift and I got ready and I couldn't get my door to open. I tried everything. Finally, my friend and co-worker had to come and take the pins out of the door so I could get out. We joked how the ghost didn't want me to leave. It never happened again. Then one night I went to bed. My husband had fallen asleep, but I'd been reading. I was dozing off and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a bright streak of light. It went up into my lamp on my dresser. I did not move. I pretended to toss around a little and put my arm over my face, but just enough so I could still peek. The light and orb this time came slowly out from under the lampshade and floated next to the bed. I was so happy that I slept on the back and stretched out. And then I woke up slowly and saw this young boy and he was just standing there looking at me and my husband like he was curious about us. I'm not sure what startled him but he, he squished back up into a ball of bright light and streaked off up under the lamp again at which point I sat up in bed and said what the hell and the streak of light darted out from the lamp went out the doorway. I jumped and locked the door, turned off all the lights, and spent the rest of the night waiting for it to come back. I moved shortly after that. I am happy to say it didn't follow me. Now, a friend of mine moved in there for a while, and it used to move her things and hide them. She thought her kids were doing it, but I know it was the ghost of that little boy and maybe something else. 
So I hope you enjoyed these stories. Please subscribe to my channel. Hit the like if you're watching me on YouTube. You can also catch a podcast version on TuneIn, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes. And you can also go to my website and download an MP3 file if that's what you would like to do. I would like to remind my true believers... I would love to hear your true ghost stories or anything unusual that's ever happened to you. Just send me uh, either an email or if you want to film yourself with your phone or record yourself with an MP3 file, send it to Marlene at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. I would love to hear your stories. Uh, No matter how fantastical and no no matter what it's about, ghosts, Bigfoot, UFOs, cryptids, just weird stuff. Don't forget about it. And thank you so much for being part of my audience. You guys are just wonderful.